Take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 15. Paul the Apostle is writing to the church in Ephesus. These are the words recorded in the New Living Translation. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and for your love of God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. This week is Thanksgiving week. Family and friends across the nation will gather around a feast with family and friends. They will travel many miles. They will spend enormous for the din dinner. And that preparation, nothing will be left undone. And as the meal is being partaken of, family and friends will share what they are most thankful for. That's what Paul the Apostle is doing. He's looking up to heaven, and he's saying, Father God, I thank you. I thank you for the church in Ephesus. In chapter 1, verse 1, he wrote this, I'm writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, he's thankful because these people are faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, he describes here in verse 15 that their faith is strong. They don't bend to the wind. They don't read the latest and greatest trend. The truth in the word of God has established their faith. They have filled their heart with the word of God. They have made it a lifestyle to follow and walk with Christ. Filled with the Holy Spirit. And now, Paul says, your faith has become strong. And finally, he recognizes them for their love. Their love for the household of faith. Their love for the brothers and sisters in the fellowship, in the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit. He says, I thank God that you are such a wonderful, loving family of faith that you love each one that gathers with you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he launches off in the final verses of chapter 1 of prayer. And he expresses his prayer life. He begins by saying, I pray for you constantly. I pray for you without ending. Now, this is a healthy ministry. There are attributes about this church that it's a loving church, that it's a strong, faithful church, that it is filled with followers, faithful in following Christ. A healthy ministry. And yet, he is saying, I'm constantly praying for you. On occasion, someone will cross my path. And they'll be very passionate at about a, an emergency. And I become emotional. Their emotions causes me to become emotional over this urgent crisis, this dramatic event that has just happened. And after we pray and they depart, I ponder for a moment. I don't see that person in church very often. I never see them at prayer meetings. When the church opens its doors for a time of prayer, they're never there. But in an emergency or something that's a crisis or something that is traumatic, they are quick to call upon the Lord in their time of great need. I commend them for crying out to God. I commend them that when they are in the storm and in a pit of trouble that they cry out to the Lord. But there is a standard that Paul lays out to us, and he models it right here. He's writing to a healthy ministry. 
And he's writing to them and saying, I am praying constantly for you. It makes me wonder, was this church healthy because of Paul's prayers? Was this church strong in its faith and strong as followers of Christ and filled with the love of the Lord to all folks around them because somebody was praying for them? There is a relationship to Paul's prayer and the transformation that happens in the early New Testament church. You would actually be hard pressed to turn to any of Paul's letters to any of the churches, not see his declaration of prayer. Consider Romans chapter 1, verse 9. God knows how often I pray for the church in Rome. He's writing to a group of people he's never met. And he begins his letter by saying, I pray for you continuously. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul wrote, I pray for you. I pray for you. I pray continuously for the church in Philippi. Or how about the church in Colossia? Chapter 1, verse 3 of Colossians. We always pray for you. Or 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. We pray for you constantly. Perhaps the attribute of health and growth in the early New Testament church was directly related to the prayer of the leadership. Praying for the sister church in Rome, the sister church in Greece, and the sister church in Asia Minor, praying that God would bless them, praying that God would pour out his spirit here to the church in Ephesians chapter 1. He lays out regarding the church in Ephesus three very, very specific prayers that he's been praying. I pray for you constantly, verse 17, asking God, the glorious Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ to give to you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. Number one, Paul is praying that the people in Ephesus would grow in their knowledge of God. How is this growth going to happen? Well, he prays and petitions the Lord for spiritual insight and spiritual wisdom. Insight or understanding. Divine revelation. God speaking to the sheep. The shepherd speaking to the sheep. The shepherd bringing revelation and understanding to the truth that comes only from heaven. The Bible is the only book that's ever been written. The Bible is the only book that's ever been printed that unless you know the author personally, you will not fully understand it. You will memorize dates. You will learn to spell difficult names that I can hardly but struggle to pronounce. You will fill your mind with an encyclopedia about the Bible, the thousands of stories, the hundreds and thousands of proverbs, the many, many prophecies. But unless you know the author, you will not fully understand the Word of God. The Pharisees, the Sadducees were filled with knowledge, but they did not have spiritual wisdom. They did not have spiritual insight. They did not have divine spiritual revelation. 
And they did not grow spiritually. Jesus would speak of the Pharisee or Sadducee, the religious leader, as being deaf, unable to hear, blind, unable to see. How can the blind lead the blind, Jesus would ask. You have the knowledge, but yet you don't really know him. To know the Lord speaks of a relationship. It speaks beyond scientific information. At the university, you can take the Bible as Bible literature. You can study the purpose of the letter, the purpose of the book, the date that it was written, and who possibly wrote the book. You can have all kinds of knowledge and yet not grow in your knowledge of who God is. King David would show us. King David longed to be in the presence of the Lord. He would sit in the sanctuary. He would just sit in the presence of God that he might know him. He would talk to the Lord, pour out his heart. He would share with God his deepest pain, his greatest fears, his greatest failures, those things that he struggled with the most. He spoke to God as one that was growing in his intimate relationship of knowing who the Lord is. That's Paul's prayer. Paul is praying that every believer would have spiritual wisdom, would have spiritual insight, would have divine revelation, and would grow in their intimate, personal relationship that they might say, I know the Lord. The shepherd speaks to the sheep. And Jesus, the good shepherd, says, And the sheep know my voice. And the shepherd calls his sheep by name. Yes, the Bible is a book to study, but it is the bread of life. It is something to meditate, to chew upon, and literally devour into our lives. It is the manna from heaven. God spoke to Noah. God spoke to Abraham. God spoke to Adam. God spoke to Noah. Have you ever pondered? Have you ever pondered that Moses had this burning bush experience? But that was not the end of knowing God. That was the beginning. When God would lead Moses up Mount Sinai, some 8,500 foot elevation gain. God would speak to him. God would reveal himself to him. But again, that was not the end of the relationship. That was the beginning of knowing God. And over and over and over again, the Bible says, that as Moses walked down the trail, descended from the peak of Mount Sinai, God would draw him back that he might reveal more and more to him. This 80-year-old man named Moses, the Bible records twice, three times, four, maybe six, some say eight, eight times perhaps. Study it for yourself and consider how many times God drew Moses up to the top of Mount Sinai. Here's the point. The point is not how many times did he go, but the point is that he went for the divine revelation. For each event at the top of that peak, God was showing Moses more and more of who he was. And then, God directs him to build a tabernacle that he might meet with him, that he might reveal himself, that Moses might have spiritual insight, spiritual insight, spiritual knowledge, spiritual wisdom, that he would grow in knowing the Lord. 
And how often did Moses go into the tent of meeting? Over and over and over and over again. And what about David? David loved the sanctuary. David was drawn to the sanctuary. That's knowing the Lord. The first prayer that Paul prays is I pray for spiritual insight, spiritual wisdom that you may grow. The second prayer is found here in verse 18. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he has called, his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I pray that your hearts would be flooded with the light that dwelling inside of you is the light, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I am the light of the world, Jesus said. And that light dwells within your heart. And Paul's prayer was that your heart would be filled to the point of flooding with the light of Christ, with understanding in your heart. In the book of Genesis, God spoke the word and he said, Let there be light. In the Gospels, Jesus said, I am the light. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus was speaking about the light when he said, No one lights a lamp and then hides it or puts it under a basket. In contrast, the lamp is to be placed on a stand, a position where its light can be seen by all who enter the house. Through the years, I've met different ones that had large libraries in their den. They were students of the Word of God. And when I entered their home, they were very passionate about the things of God and the Word of God. It thrilled my heart. And they would study and study and study. And as they studied, they'd get so excited. And I could not help but ask, you have such knowledge. You have such passion. God has clearly spoken to you. Have you ever led a Bible study? Have you ever shared what God is saying to you with someone else? And the person would say no. And I was, I was pondering how can that be? How can God put so much light inside of a heart? Have so much passion to study the word and to gather insight and, and, and divine revelation. And not be passionate. To share with someone else. I challenge. I challenge people every day. What is God saying to you? What light has God put in your heart? That Sunday morning a sister came to me and said. God has done something incredible in my life. And, and I, 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 I can't believe everything God has shown me. May I share this morning? I said, by all means. And the next 12 minutes, she shared what God miraculously has done in her life and the revelation God has shown her in her own walk with Christ. To become the light, the light of the world. Clearly, Jesus is the light. But Christ dwells within us. And because Christ dwells within us, he puts us in a position. He gives us a target. He gives us an assignment. He gives to us a mission. And he says, stand right here and speak and let your light shine. Jesus went on in the same text in verse 34 of Luke 11 saying, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, the whole body is filled with light. But when your eye becomes unhealthy, 
Your body will not be filled with light. Your body will be filled with darkness. And then he warns by saying, make certain that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. At the university, I've met folks teaching the Bible as literature. Clearly, as I said under some, I could say they had no personal relationship with God. They spoke and shared nothing of their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And throughout the semester, as I would visit with one, I would realize this person not only did not receive Christ, he did not believe in Christ, and here he is teaching the word of God, and he doesn't know the author. And yet, the words are used to describe the lectures, that this is enlightenment or insight, when in reality, it's exactly as Jesus described. They actually did not have the light. Actually, they were filled with darkness. If you are filled with light, with no dark corners, your whole life will become radiant, as though a floodlight was filling your light. And finally, we come to the third prayer. The first prayer Paul prayed was for spiritual wisdom divine revelation, insight, and understanding. The second prayer he prays is the heart would be flooded with the light of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And finally, we come to verse number 19, where Paul says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible, the incredible greatness of God's Power for us who believe in him. Jesus and the power in the name of Jesus. And the power Jesus has over the blind, over the de deaf, over the sick, those with disease. How Jesus could take a broken heart and mend it. How Jesus could bring everlasting water to the woman at the well. How Jesus could speak to the woman caught in adultery, ready to be judged with the penalty of death by stoning, only to encounter the Messiah and discover the power of the forgiveness and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes, I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power. And then he amplifies it. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Raised up. Crucified by man, lifeless body laid in the tomb. But the stone is rolled away, and the Son of the living God is raised from the depths of death. The power of Almighty God. And Paul explains three attributes of this power in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has power. Jesus has authority. Jesus and only Jesus can complete the church. Now he is far above any ruler, any authority, any power on earth. Jesus has all authority given to him by God. And only Christ is the head of the church. Only Christ can complete the church, for the church is his body, and it is made full and complete by Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, 
His power, His authority, His completeness in Jesus' name.